Coming up, Universal Orlando announced two new hotels. We have more details on Fast and Furious Supercharged. Plus, we are going to recap some of our final thoughts on Halloween Horror Nights 27. From the Bob Varley Studio in Orlando, Florida, this is the Universal Edition of The Diz Unplugged. This is episode 152 of the Dis Unplugged Universal Edition. The Dis Unplugged Universal Edition is brought to you by Dreams Unlimited Travel, experts at helping you plan the perfect universal vacation. Visit them on the web at www.dreamsunlimitedtravel.com. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Diz Unplugged Universal Edition. I am your host, Craig Williams, and today I am joined alongside by my co-host, Mr. Rhino Clavin. Hello. 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 Yes. La, la, la. La, la, la. Okay, so we uh back in the studio for yet another week. I know, we're, on, we're like rocking pretty much two weeks straight now, I think, with studio shows and nothing in the parks. Now, wait, we had the butterbeer last week, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, I was like, yeah. what are you talking about? I don't remember being here last week. <laughs> A whoopity-doo. Did you put something in my drink again? Um, I'll never tell. <laughs> uh, okay, so that got weird real fast. But let's take things away from the weirdness and uh, let's let's actually kind of not procrastinate too much on what we're here to talk about. And that is Universal Orlando today. So I am going to, uh, you know, I, I know everyone out there, including myself, is already in the Christmas spirit. Christmas. Chris, Christmas, Christmas spirit. The Christmas, Christmas spirit. Christmas. Uh, we're, all, we're all feeling holly and jolly. So... I'm actually going to make the executive decision right now. We are going to wait until the very end of the show in order to talk about Halloween Horror Night stuff because that way I'm giving people the option. I oh, see. I thought you would just start right out so we can get rid of Halloween and move into Christmas. See, I thought about that, but my thought is some people may not want to technically listen to us talking about it. They don't. They they're done with oh, Halloween. So they don't I want see. it. Yeah. So we're gonna give you some stuff up at the front. Easier to skip. Yeah. So that stuff way, up in the front. you know, it, we're gonna put it all in the front. All the, we're not gonna like. We're not gonna hide it anywhere in there. Like a mullet. HHN's gonna be in the back. All the good stuff that you probably are coming here to listen our opinions on. I mean, this stuff has already been out there. The Fast and Furious and in the hotels. I mean, so the. the, the old news at this point if anything but i know you want our opinions i know you on want it. me oh, oh this from your favorite artist is it pitbull pit oh ew yeah i know throw a little throwback for you oh why why would you do that to me i just like to toss you for a loop while you while you get everything that you need to we need to get chatting about Yes. So why don't we start on the that's called burning time. Thank you very much for it. Let's start off with the big announcement. And that is two new hotels coming to that wet and wild spot. The fact that the hotels were coming was not anything really uh, per se in terms of news. We we know that it, they've been filing permits and stuff to zone this land yes. for more, more hotels. But this is the first time that Universal has officially gone on record and put it out there that there will be two new hotels. And unfortunately, as of this time, we do not know the names for them. But they did release some concept art and some more details on it. So if you haven't seen it yet, this is a, this is a shot of one of the two hotels. I would assume this is going to be the larger of the two. So the deets on this is that one of the hotels is uh, going to have 750 rooms. Can, and you, put that, can you put that in perspective? Like uh, what size 750, is I believe that's the bit smaller than Hard Rock and Portofino. Mm -hmm. I believe they both are, they might actually be at 750. You're just you're throwing this at the top of my. I'm just curious. I don't know. I, that was for my own personal thing. It wasn't even for people. I just I don't know how many rooms are in a hotel regularly. I would have thought less than that. So I mean, it sounds some, like a lot to me. Well, like Aventura, the tower that's being built right now, that's going to have uh, 600 rooms. Okay. So when you when you think about it in that perspective, uh, this is definitely uh, the smaller of the two hotels here are going to to have. Um, 
less than Aventura as itself. So, uh, you know, I also have a computer. I could have Googled it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You're good. It's I used to know the amount of rooms at all the hotels, like off the top of my head. Like Cabana Bay, I know it has 1,800 rooms total. Well, that was because, the first one I Googled. So, yeah, <laughs> that, it, was a waste that of my has time. 1,800 because um, there's. 900 family suites and then 900 Craig, standard rooms. This says 2200. Oh, I forgot about the tower. They yeah. had an extra 400. Yeah. The two new towers had an extra 400 rooms on that. Thank you for reminding me. You're welcome. Um, Thank you, Google. On that. Yeah, no, that's one of those things. I just, I still haven't even stayed in those new towers. I've never even so. stayed at that hotel, hotel, period. Oh, I feel bad for you. It's I know, a, someday. It's a lovely someday. experience, but. Okay, so yeah, the uh, there's going to be 2,800 guest rooms total in these hotels. The one will have 750 rooms, as I've already mentioned, and the other hotel will have um, the the rest, the 2,050 Jeez, rooms. Wow! And that's, I mean, that's a that's a big hotel, but it's also not just going to be a massive two massive hotels uh, kind of all crunched together in the same area. These are going to be the most affordable universal hotels. So right now the, the value hotels are considered Cabana Bay. And then when Aventura opens up, opens up those, uh, you know, those, those are the two values. This, when it opens in summer 2019, will start at less than a hundred dollars a night for a hotel room. And technically you, even though you are, on the wet and wild property and you're not like at, at universal Orlando, like, yes, you can walk there, but you're going to have to cross the road. It's, it's not like an easy hop, skip and a jump. Like it is walking from hard rock or Portofino to get yeah. it's, this is, this is going to be outskirts. a little bit of a hike. Like they, they will have free transportation provided. So that way you can get to universal, but uh, it, you know, it's it, it's still not far away, but it will. That's what I was kind of trying to say. To say it, it will still have the amenities. So if you stay at these hotels, you'll still have early park admission. Okay. And you'll still have like all the same things you can do on property. Don't want to haul all your bags all the way back there. Well, you know they have package pickup and in the stuff in uh, in uh, blah, 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 charging privileges all throughout. So. These are going to be very, very affordable hotels. As you saw from that concept art that I did put up, uh, the theming kind of around them is definitely coastal, beachy in a way, but definitely... You, you can tell because of the sails in the water. Yeah, that is that is one, one part of the ways that you can tell it. But, uh, I mean, it's an interesting take on it. I feel like they already had kind of the beachy theme with Cabana Bay. Yeah. To a certain extent, mixing well, the fifties with Lowe's the beachy, too, kind of is beachy a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Sapphire it's Falls. Sapphire Falls. I'm sorry, I didn't finish. Sapphire the Falls, the kind of beachy. Uh, uh, technically, Royal Pacific well, also kind of beachy, but yeah. this is this feels kitschy beachy. Uh, <laughs> if that's a well, thing. son of but, a beach, <laughs> they're doing it again. <laughs> oh, that should have been the headline for the article. <laughs> yeah, it should have been right. So uh, you know, it's palm trees aplenty. Uh, between the two hotels, there will be three poles, two food courts offering breakfast, lunch, and dinner, hmm. coffee bars, poolside bars, fitness rooms, car rental facilities, and they promise more. Uh, and then the rest of the details on it, reservations aren't open yet. They'll start accepting them in early 2018. So it is, it's coming, and it's coming fast because it's going to be open, like I said, summer 2019. I'm very very intrigued by this. I'm intrigued to uh, see how they're gonna, what they're gonna do about that roadway over there, because I know they had said a while back that their their goal was to help, um, not facilitate, but to reduce the congestion over there somehow. Yeah. So I'm curious if they like toss that to the wind, or if it's still gonna be like it, it. They're gonna have to now because now they're creating a thing that's gonna have even more traffic than Wet and Wild even did. I would think. I would think. I don't yeah. Know. No, it's definitely going to cause a lot more congestion. That area is always bad to begin with. Uh, just that stretch of iDrive that it's on. It's just a million lights, and all, nobody knows where they're going. Let, let's uh, all of iDrive. iDrive, in comparison to, like, uh, is as much of a cluster as I-4 is, 
I drive, even though it's just one road through there, I feel like it should be six lanes in order to accommodate the amount of people who want to get lost down there. Oh, and gosh. then just, even yeah. once you get, once you're down there, it's, uh, you know, it, there are sections where it's three lanes across and it is not abnormal to see someone try to be in like a left-hand turn lane and then shoot over and take a random right. Yep. Just out of nowhere. Yeah. It is a... It's just a nightmare to be there, and I'm not saying that Universal is making a bad choice in terms of expanding down this no, way. It's, it's where their it, land is, you know. Yeah, it, it's their only choice. They yeah. don't have a say in, um, in how, like, you know, it, where are they going to build? They only have really these plots of lands to do it. So they have to, they just have to put up with the nightmare that it is, and hopefully they can come in and help facilitate everything so that way maybe traffic gets a little bit better but there's no doubt about it this will cause extra congestion and extra headaches in in and around this area but i think it's going to do one more thing too and that is it's going to definitely bring a lot more of those i drive customers technically staying on site now at universal and maybe it will also get them in the theme park Plenty of people stay hmm. on iDrive. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just there's a lot of cheap hotels. I was going to say, if they're, if they're creating competition for those hotels that are down there, then yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's smart. I mean, there's a lot of people first time that come down to Orlando that if they're not necessarily staying at oh, Universal or you have. Yeah, when yeah. I was a kid, this is when we stayed at Universal, I remember staying on a hotel at iDrive. It was like, a, I, it might not even be there anymore. It was like a Holiday Inn. Yeah. Not a Holiday Inn. It was like a uh, Days Inn or something like that. The one that has the sun as the logo. Days Inn. It was back when there was an F.A.O. Schwartz down that way, oh, too. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. But that's, I mean, that's a, it's, if you want to maybe go to Disney or Universal, but you don't want to stay on site at either of them. I drive was always that option that mm-hmm. was kind of right in the middle of both, easily accessible to get to those and SeaWorld. And now Universal's putting their their footprint right on I drive in a in a part where, you know, it's it, Disney's still much more of a hike to get to than Universal at this wet and wild intersection, but it's starting to move closer and closer towards Disney. And as, as it gets closer and closer, it is a good option to say, like, now you are you have everything that you want on iDrive. You can have the feeling that you're kind of, like, right in the middle of anything, but you're also staying on site at Universal as part of it, too. That's kind of a, that's kind of a good catch in there. So I, I, I think they are going to take a lot of business away from people on iDrive, other hotels, especially at the price point that they're saying, starting at... Uh, sub $100 and they are then going to translate it if people are staying at the hotel already because it's on International Drive if if they get stuff like early park admission why not pop into the theme parks too yeah. and make more of a vacation and at the same thing it just it opens up even more for people who want an affordable vacation maybe try Universal for the first time they don't want to go all in on spending a ton of money on it this is now another option for them uh, it just it is checking off more and more of what Universal needs. Universal needed more rooms, and I think they needed more rooms at a lower cost point. Uh, same same as when Disney decided that they had to go all in on value resorts for a little while. Now Disney said, okay, well, we have plenty of value rooms. We have plenty of everything. The next thing we need is lots of DVC. Luxury. So, oh, luxury. Yeah. Well, well now yeah. there's a new thing. They've now got so many in every category, DVC and then all the others, that they're like, well, let's create a new category. Yeah, so it's just they're addressing their needs. Universal's addressing their needs. I think this is uh, this is going to be very interesting when it opens up. We'll definitely stay there at some point as long as it happens, I guess. And we're still we're still alive for it. Yeah, I just got real bleak there. Yeah, geez, so, dark. Well, <laughs> speaking of dark... Let's move on to the Fast and Furious. Because it's the dark horse attraction? Uh, I, I don't know if calling it a dark it's horse... It's a dark it, ride. Uh... No, I mean because there's no way to really be happy when you're talking about Fast and Furious supercharged. It's just dark. It's brooding. It's just, yeah, brooding. No, it's uh, just... 
throwing a little bit of uh, funny out there with it. It wasn't funny at all. I don't even know why I'm beating around the bush on it. So more new details released on Fast and Furious Supercharged. Uh, Not just details, but also some, some more pictures of what it's going to look like. But let's go over the details first before, uh, for those of you watching, before I start showing off what what this uh, attraction is going to look like a little bit more, I'm, uh, we're, we're going to go over everything about it. So let's start off with what Universal is promising about it, and that is that Fast and Furious Supercharged at Universal Studios Florida will have New characters, a new story, supercharged cars, and the virtual line experience. Instead of uh, oh. the tram tour portion at Hollywood that has just an experience and some of the characters. So uh, you've heard our feelings about the Hollywood version. So I'm not going to waste time going over our thoughts and feelings on that. It's a mess. That's all oh, we yeah. have to say. But let's go over what they're saying for this one. So uh, Universal confirmed that Dom, Letty, Hobbs, uh, Roman, and Owen Shaw will all be returning for Fast and Furious Supercharged. And, of course, they're played by Vin Diesel, Michelle Rodriguez, Dwayne Johnson, Tyrese, and Luke Evans, all, uh, all respectively in the order of their character names. So when they put out that right away, it, it, obviously my mind went straight to, okay, well, it... It literally is going to just be a replica of Hollywood, kind of the same way that the the big video portion of Kong Kong was. Yeah, uh, because that's literally what Fast and Furious Supercharged is at Hollywood. Mm-hmm. It's you go through the first couple of pre-show rooms, and that's when you see these characters. And then finally, when you get into the action, then it is like over the top animated versions of these characters that oh, just gosh, look yeah. so weird, awful, just literally the worst. So apparently as part of the story is that Dom's inviting all of us to attend an after race party and Owen Shaw will track us down and lead us into a high speed chase again. Owen Shaw is the Jason Statham character? No, no, that's the Luke Evans character. It's Jason Statham plays his brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I thought his last name was Shaw. That's why I was. Yeah, it so, is. It is, but yeah. And then okay. their mother is played by uh, Helen Mirren. Oh, that's how she fits in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They couldn't get her for this attraction, uh, huh? Hey, no, they, they couldn't. They couldn't lead her in with this one, but <laughs> maybe. Uh, but who they did drag in this time around is they got from the film Tej, which of course is uh, Chris Luda. Chris, I don't remember his last name, but Ludacris, and then Mia Toretto, played by Jordana Brewster. Uh, they'll be joining the family this She's time around. Be in the new movie. Oh, is she? Yeah, they just said she was coming back again. Oh, very, very nice. Hey, she's been absent. I don't know who she is, so I don't know. I don't know what it means. I can't remember the characters. Uh, was she Paul Walker's girlfriend? She was Paul Walker's girlfriend. Isn't okay. It? Because that's, yeah, I'm assuming that's probably why she, Wasn't she didn't in the come last back one. for the last one. Probably didn't write, have anything for the character to do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they. you saw the one, Paul Walker's last one, right? No, I, I okay. saw the one before that. Okay. I, I didn't see five, but I saw six, but I didn't see seven, and I haven't seen eight yet. But I'm going to watch them, so don't spoil it. Yeah, uh, I won't. We won't talk about it anymore, but I'm, I'm glad she's coming back. But so what also, as I, I mentioned in there, they said that they were adding the virtual line experience. So that was all the new characters that will be a part of it, just those two joining the rest of the characters on there. Uh, with the virtual line experience being added on, I... That's a weird decision. So we've talked a lot about virtual line experience on this show before between what's happening with it at Volcano Bay, between how it was implemented at Race Through New York starring Jimmy Fallon and kind of our thoughts on it leading up to when it actually started. Virtual line, I feel like at Jimmy Fallon, they are starting to get a a decent grip on it. And... Uh, you know, it's, I, I feel like the last time I used virtual line there, the experience was actually pretty, pretty smooth. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't, it wasn't a mess like it was in the first month or two after it opened. It wasn't, it wasn't that bad at all, but 
I think this is going to be a complete different beast. This is definitely going to be a lot busier than Race Through New York starring Jimmy Fallon was. I, I mean, I remember seeing Fast and Furious just months after it opened up on the tram tour. And th- this was a big... The tram tour, usually, anytime I would go, it would always be somewhere like between a 20, 30-minute wait for it. But I remember the time that I wrote it after this because they were throwing Fast and Furious around so much. It was like a 60-minute wait oh. for the tram tour. So, And people were disappointed. Yeah, but but people love these characters. They love... They love Fast and Furious, so I think I think that this is going to be a huge draw. I don't know how Virtual Line is going to work with an attraction that will with be... With a massive draw? Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. With, like, a really, like, large queue at all times. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I know they did all the tests with it on Despicable Me, which is also a very busy attraction. But, but... they didn't carry through with it on that, did they? No, no, no. I it's didn't think it's so. back to back to normal and all that, because I, I think a lot of the 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 good parts of virtual line experience is that you have an area to kind of wander through mm-hmm. and spend some time in between in between the different show elements yeah like they did with Fallon and here uh, they tell you that before boarding the attraction you'll be able to explore different rooms with places so you'll see stuff like Tej's high-tech war room and then the uh, Toretto family room which, that's where I'm assuming that Tej is going to be popping up in his war room. And that's why he's considered a new character because they wanted to put him in there. And if you have a family room, it would make sense that did Jordana Brewster would be in there too. Did Ludacris not make it into the r- attraction at Universal Hollywood? No, they they slimmed it down. Why? He's in all the movies, isn't he? Uh, I forget which one he started up in, but he's in the first one. I thought no, he's not in the first one. Okay, Is he? he sings the song for the second movie, so he's been in them since then at least. He's too fast, too furious. I, I, I mean, I have watched. I haven't gone back and watched the first five movies. I think since. He's definitely in the second one though because he sings a song. That's why I'm like, yeah. oh, he's in here. I, I he might only. I think it's like cameo in the first one, but he, I think he's the one who starts yeah. the race. I don't. Know. I, I can anyway. On, I yeah. just feel like it's kind of a weird thing that they cut out what has become a major character. So it's good that they're bringing it back in the fold, I guess. But I, I think it comes down to is there a purpose to have characters? Yeah. In there, and you know, it's when you're working with schedules and getting people in, it's. You, you go, you use whoever you can at the time. So I'm sure it was probably more of a, a timing and scheduling thing and seeing what made sense with the story that they were they were making originally. But His name is Chris Bridges, by the way. That's it. Okay. I, I always know the Chris Ludacris, and then I always forget the last part of it. Uh, but yeah, so... <laughs> I, I'm assuming by just what they're saying with what we'll see in the pre-show that this is where our new characters are going to be added into it. That they're going to be more of uh, the ones setting up the story for us. And that's how they're they're finding a way to bring it in there. Also with that, with the whole pre-show elements, they're, they're saying that we're going to see 15 different cars along the way, including uh, Dom's, Dom's oh. signature car hmm. that he drives. But... Uh, yeah, will there will be fifteen authentic cars to Fast and Furious throughout the entire attraction? Which I feel like that's taking a big step up. And uh, so, yeah, we're gonna go through this pre-show, and then eventually we'll get on a what appears to be like a party bus that I guess that Tej made. I have the answer for you now. Sorry, what is it? It's he's in Too Fast Too Furious. That is the first one yeah. he was in um, because he was the referee of the race, and then. He's not. He's in Fast Five when uh, Paul Walker's character asked him to come and join their their heist okay. the team. Yeah. So and then he's in the mall from then on. Yeah. So, hey, right. there's your answer on that. So, uh, yeah, it's all it's all very interesting to say the least. So, here's a uh, for those of you watching, not listening to this. Here's a look at the outside of the building for Fast and Furious Supercharged. Uh, hey, it's not a surprise based on. If I mean we've we've been through Universal and have seen it lately, it looks like the facade is a hundred percent finished at this point. There's just construction walls blocking it to really show 
how complete it actually is, but like the brick building out front where you're going to enter in, that's that's been done for a while now, and it's it's said Fast and Furious up on there, so uh, that's that's not a really big surprise. And uh, whoa, that's that's really small. So movie magic there. Uh, <laughs> here's just a look inside of one of the rooms, as you can see. So for audio people, uh, basically a bunch of fake people. Uh, based on Universal's design artists, uh, concept artists are looking at the back of a uh, like the the front of a, a truck. So very very interesting on that. And one happy thing that I was uh, glad to see because someone shared this concept art with me a while back, and I'm glad to find out that it was actually real. But we had uh, they released finally what the party bus that you're getting on is is going to look like and for me it's essentially like a remake of the kong cars kind of as well as the studio tram cars together but it just looks like a party bus lots of neon lights so they definitely destroyed this building right oh where'd you go they definitely Uh destroyed this building right that my question is is it going to be the same track the same way it, 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 is it going to be disaster again no is, I, it, is it that same ride vehicle system in and out no it's not like a subway going in and out the, the I building know it's not like a subway but you know what i mean is it the ride track no, pull you in that same no one? no no god no that is okay outdated technology there's no way they're doing that it's going to have to make a loop it's okay not... so it'll have to move more than that okay that's because yeah. that's my question and that's the fear i've been having where i thought oh this will be cool they're gonna have a ride that moves in here but now this even this picture looks vaguely like that system so that's what makes me nervous what do you mean it looks like this look system? at this this is coming out of a tunnel this is a uh 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 a uh, car or loading vehicle this looks like the ho- the same thing that disaster looked like to me just imagine the disaster subway right there Right where it yeah, is. Yeah, I, I mean, see I kind of, I see where you're saying with that, but it's, it's like the loading also, is even the same. It's well, that you could say that about like uh, everything. I know, literally it, I'm everything. I'm just saying, like, I thought the idea was ripping this all down and do something really new. So that's just so, and it could just be this 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 piece of art looks similar yeah. to that. That's all. I, you I know? think you're getting caught up in that a little too I just much. Get it's, nervous. It's like, I mean, that would be like assuming that. Dragon Challenge is tore down, but they're just going to replicate the same track path because it's in the exact same space. I'm, they're uh, you know they're gonna make what, track path was what I was looking for. Good word usage. They're they're gonna make whatever like the best out of it if they can, and even if it is a thing where it just has to pull forward and then back right back up, it's uh, I mean they have to do with what they have to do with it. But really, it wouldn't make sense because. Part of the reason why Disaster was able to do that was because you had about 20 minutes of pre-shows leading up to this little four-minute portion mm-hmm. where it goes out and then comes straight back. With this, I mean, you can clearly tell from the concept art again that this is a bus with a front half and then the back half of a bus. So it, there's no way that they're going to limit the capacity for this ride to just these amount of people on here being dispatched out for four minutes and then coming right back. That would be so incredibly dumb. The ride would, the ride would be like one of the lowest capacity rides at universal Orlando. So, uh, my assumption based on looking at the vehicles is the vehicles literally look the exact same as Kong skull Island, uh, just a little bit bigger and, You know, obviously they look like a bus, not a truck. So I would assume that this is also going to be a trackless ride, just like Kong is, and it's going it's going to do a full loop around. Okay. So that that's what I I think of it. I hope. I hope. Yeah. It's just that again, that system with disaster worked because you had people in pre shows before, and then that subway car that you went in held a crap ton of people. Yeah. So you can put 200 people on that subway, send it out, and then send it back every four minutes, and it works. But with this, they, they just can't do that. Mm-hmm. It would The capacity would be so extraordinarily low that it, it would just be mind-boggling. It would boggle the mind. <laughs> but, like Rogue One, what is it? 
that monster. He's Boogalum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so stupid. That was that was a great reference. I that's I what I think it. of whenever you say boggle the mind now. A boogalum. A boogalum. Whatever he says. <laughs> Excellent. So that's the that's the details as of right now on Fast and Furious Supercharged. Uh it will open up this spring, spring. at some point. So spring. I would say by by before March. um yeah, I would say in March. Probably yep. shoot for a grand opening the first week of March, right before spring break gets hot and heavy. But we will we will see eventually what what happens down the road with that. So that is going to uh, take us away from both of those news items. And we are just going to wrap up with a little bit of talk on uh, on the, the last little bits of thoughts and feelings with Halloween Horror Nights 27. So I guess the first question I'm going to, before we go over like our final house rank list, all that stuff, Rhino, this year... As a whole, now that the event's over, you looked back on it, went many, many times with your pass. Mm-hmm. Would you say it's a success or not? Nah. Not not unsuccessful, but it just was kind of a meh year, I feel like, in the, in the end of it. You know, could have been the hurricane, could have been the mix of things. I don't know. But after after all was said and done, this hasn't been my favorite year. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. Uh, it There was something about the event this year while i think they had probably one of the best houses in years uh uh, one of my favorite houses of any event period that i've ever attended at halloween horror nights and one of my favorite scare zones that they've ever created this year it just felt like there was so much in like the bottom half that just couldn't make up for the fact that there was some amazing things. You know, it's like, yes, I I love Trick or Treat. That was by far the best scare zone. Mm-hmm. But not unless you walk through Trick or Treat a million times, it doesn't make up for the fact that Invasion just never really had a payoff. That Festival of the Deadliest remained just, blah. And it just made me feel not uncomfortable in the good Halloween way. It made me feel like a pervert. Yeah. I, I feel like the altars of horror kind of went downhill more and more. Like the first week I was into it. Well, Second it week like I was into it. Nobody was there after yeah. that. I feel like it was just the Grady twins and then like the other ones just blended in and it was just yeah. like, okay, nothing's it, here. Yeah. And I mean, I still appreciate the theatrics of the purge, but it's tired. Yeah. Uh, it definitely was not as fresh as it could have been, but they they worked their butts off in that scare zone. There's a lot of ground to cover in there. A lot of people make their way through there, and I think they did an excellent job with yeah. what they have to work My with. My friend even said, and it was his first time on one of the last nights, he said um, something about, like, he doesn't like getting scared or anything like that, yeah. but he was saying that, I don't like the purge, and he said, and I don't like, you know, but I, it's a big area. And he said, I like kind of the production of what they're doing in there. He's like, I just don't care for what it is. And I was like, yeah, I was like, and they've had yeah. ones in there before that have you really used that space really well. And I agree. I was like, compared to all the other ones, it's like, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. And I mean, that's, I, I feel bad too. Like, definitely... Academy of the Villain Academy of Villains got hit hardest by the weather issues that we had before uh, the event started, but it, it felt like that show just never got off the ground. I know. It was a, a lot of the, and I, I still watched it basically once a weekend. Um, I watched it again the last the last night I went. Yeah, a little bit. You know, I didn't watch the, the entirety because that's stupid. Uh, the contortionist Creeper was comes just out. yeah yeah Ooh, it, that's I don't like it elbows coming out yeah and that's not Damn like yeah. an issue with the show it's just that disgusts it just yeah me. It creeps me out too yeah. much yeah I don't I've, like it in the American Horror Story house either yeah I've never <laughs> never been a fan of contortionist so that part <laughs> disgusted me but I mean he was still incredibly talented uh you know the show was still high energy they made they made the best of a bad situation but it just never it never caught. That it never grasped on and like really went forward with it. It still felt like uh, an incomplete show mm-hmm. every time. Uh, so there was uh, there was that that also hurt. Not not amazing scare zones. Academy of Villains not being as high energy and as big as last year. But I will say that Bill and Ted was 
exceptional throughout the entire event, even when they had to make changes due to due to some topical issues that were happening mm-hmm. throughout uh, the world. But uh, like I was able to go to the very last show for guests after after they did a um, after the final show that they did for guests, they did hold a special team member show that team members got to be the the last people to ever see bill and ted and only they were allowed into it but i did have a friend who attended both the final show and the team member show and word is that our the final show for guests was a million times better than the team member show oh good but part of that i think would go in that for for the last show ever for us i mean it, it started off interesting right away like going through the Sean Spicer part, which we can say spoilers about it now because the show's over, so you don't have a chance to see it anymore. Mm. Uh, Like, the show kicked off with kind of Sean Spicer, Melissa McCarthy playing Sean Spicer on SNL, and, like, that, it took probably, normally that was, like, a four or five minute bit. It probably took about ten minutes Mm. to get through that section right away with all, just with people losing their minds, clapping, and uh, just you know, just getting into the show right away. And that show ended up going about a full hour long. It might have been just shy of an hour, but uh, the show was supposed to start at 1230, ended up kicking off at like 1240. And I didn't, I think I was to my car at like, then what would have been one o'clock because it was daylight savings time. Uh, But they, I mean, for the final show, they just, they just went full board. Like one of the first jokes in the show after you after Death comes out, the Grim Reaper comes out and is talking to Bill and Ted. Uh, they make an announcement for Betty White that Betty White's going to be signing autographs on the lawn. And the joke throughout the entire thing was, "Oh well, you know I've got to go visit her." But then in this show, for the final show, they actually had one of the actors come out playing Betty White <laughs> and just you know it just. They added so many little things like that throughout the way. So they had a section this year with with Rick and Morty, and uh, they well with with only Rick. But when Rick came out this time for the final show, they also had Doc Brown pop out too. Which, uh. if you don't know, Rick Rick and Morty is kind of based on Back to the Future with Doc and Marty. So it was kind of Doc and Rick standing back and forth going one on one at each other. And it was it was just perfect, especially because uh of the the impact that Back to the Future has had on on the history of Universal with Bill and Ted's and, you know, like that was that was how the show kicked off back in the twenty fifth year when when they had their big spectacle with uh, Bill and Ted losing their their time machine, so they get dropped off by Doc yeah, and the that DeLorean. Was great. I that. So uh, it was cool to see him back. So I, they also they threw in like just a lot of fan favorites from the past year, bringing stuff out. So the Moana section was the standout, hmm. the standout part of this year's show, and like a long, long standing ovation for. Uh, the actress who played Moana, but then it was supposed to be part of a Water princess. Pocahontas. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like the whole thing with her coming out, that was the princess panel where Moana comes out. And so after she's done singing and does her whole bit, then she's like, well, we have one more. And so then uh, they had Did Fat Anna Elsa. And Elsa come out? Oh. Not, not Anna, but just Elsa. Oh. And, yeah, that's great. And she came out and she sang um, the, her the do you, song instead of "Do you want to build a snowman?" It's "Do you want to eat a snow cone?" <laughs> and uh, then that goes into "I let myself go." And so to have her reprise that was just that's cool, absolutely uh, awesome. It was it was very cool for them to bring that back when they had the Rocket Raccoon section. Rocket's obviously a puppet that they have. It was a puppet in a food truck. Uh, little bit that they did and so in this final one rocket does die and they brought back the smog puppet dying from uh, i believe it was 2014 when they did that which was was just really really awesome but then it you know it was going into the final songs and stuff like the emotions were just extremely high 
for everyone in the cast. And so the when they went into the final song where they normally did like uh, We Will Rock You and and Freddie Mercury comes out, starts singing, instead of going with all that this time around, they had all of the all of the Bill and Ted's performers, everyone in the cast, dress up as either Bill or Ted. And so it was just all Bill and Ted's on the stage with Bill and Ted. And it was a really great ending. But then to get them off the stage after they made a, a short speech about, uh, you know, their every everything and telling the audience to be excellent to each other and party on all that. Then Rufus came out of mm. the the phone booth. And that's awesome. That's how they were able to end the show. And it was just it, it was so amazing to be a part of the final show. I know it wasn't the final, final one, but it was definitely the biggest one that I've ever been a part of. And I'm like, it's one of those cool things saying like, I was able to be at a historic moment. I've seen a lot of last shows from Terminator and other stuff at Universal to last shows of things at Disney. Uh, But I don't know. This was like one of the ones that was up there. Like that's cool. It's very hard for them to ever recreate something like this again. But that will uh that's that's Bill and Ted. So now we'll finally get into the last little bit of it where we officially give our final rankings for houses. And Rhino, do you want to go first? Do you want to go from worst? I'll go first. Look, I'll let you go first. Go from worst to best. Okay, the worst to the best. So the worst in my opinion was Hive. It never really grew on me much more than just like minor, mm-hmm. minor, but hmm. didn't care for it. Then I, so I would say Saw was was another one of my least favorites. Um, just I don't know, just didn't do it for me. And I kept honestly, I put it down low because I kept forgetting it was even in a house that was there. Yeah, um, Blumhouse, um, solely because like I feel like the more they've been segmenting these houses by having multiple sections in it, the more it becomes a little more less story driven and more pop scare here yeah. and there. So and then I did Dead Waters and then Scarecrow the Reaping and then Ash versus Evil Dead and then American Horror Story and The Fallen and The Shining. Mm. So The Shining was definitely my favorite. The Fallen I would say was pretty great. And then I was I was like conflicted about Ash versus Evil Dead and American Horror Story and I put American Horror Story just it edged it out a little bit. Hmm. But uh, Ash vs. Evil Dead is a personal thing. I don't yeah. think it was the best. These are my personal favorites. And honestly, my personal favorite was probably it was The Shining and then Ash vs. Evil Dead. Yeah. I'm just saying, in my opinion, like what I enjoyed yeah. the most. But Ash is like a guilty pleasure because I didn't watch the show until I went through the house. So I have like a fond attachment to that house yeah. because then I went through, watched the whole show, and I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah. I Ash ended up being really low on my list mm. because when we first started going through that, I felt like they – Everyone in there brought their A game. Yeah, it got every a, it single felt night. lazy in the last night. I yeah, went, on it, the last Friday, it was like, does Ash want to be here anymore? Yeah, like, and not just lazy, but also it felt like they were just missing actors in places. Well, a lot. the the chainsaw, the cutting off the head in the bathroom stall, I only saw that once, and I went yeah. into that house probably ten times. That's yeah. the thing that I don't understand why that was never working. But also, I also felt like I noticed on the last night the it kind of just ends abruptly. And and after going to the one in Hollywood, which we did decide this one's better, the one in Hollywood at least has the demon in the basement from the end of the second yeah. season. So I felt like the one in Hollywood was trying to tell the story of the two seasons together, which this one was doing, but it just it didn't really end. It just yeah. went and stopped, and I yeah. didn't like that. No, it uh, it that one fell down for me because it just started to feel lazy. And um, but I'll, I'll go through mine now. So my fi- my ninth. Uh, my least favorite house ended up being Saw. Not that it was a, uh, not that it was a bad house. It just, it literally did get to the point where I know where all the pigs are, and those are the only scary thing. And there's not as yeah. many pigs as there are, as there are like uh, contraptions to kill these people. So it was just. I agree. It, I think they should have had more of the the. They didn't have as many of the. So the girl who's checking her thing and the thing pulls out yeah. and then it's all her things. That was like it. None of the other ones. There was one guy that was in a thing with the the mask on, but that they didn't really have. I wanted to see more of the yeah. games. It was. It just. It never. It, it while it was entertaining. If you liked the movies, that that was about it. it I feel bad for anyone who had to wait a long time because yeah. this had a bad line every single night. Mm-hmm. It was always very busy. I feel bad for anyone who had to wait in it. 
and didn't see the movies and didn't like it because I'm sure it was just an awful experience. Uh, number eight for me was Blumhouse. It was, I, I don't know, I think the first couple times through it, it just, it seemed tight. And then, it, again, it was yeah. another one that it didn't, it was never one of my favorites, but it just really didn't do it. The fact that, the the fact that Sinistor, Sinistor, <laughs> Sinistor, Sin, Sin, the spinoff of I Sinister and you, Superstore, Sinistor. <laughs> uh, that part just, just was lacking every single time through. It was never a good part. The Purge, obviously, we know the issues with that. Just and the then, one room, and then in the Insidious is the fourth movie, so yeah. you can't even relate to any of it. And that's where it got to me. Like after so many times going through, it's like I don't care about insidious four because i haven't seen it yet and then it was really for me it was once i saw happy death day then that was like this could have been such a good house and i give the props to to the universal the hollywood insidious yeah. house because it was just an insidious house and they did have happy death day in the blum house but the insidious house there at least they made it out it was you were going through the ether so yeah. even the parts that were from the fourth one they didn't have to make sense because it mixed and mingled all the other ones but yeah. but i agree with you like it should have i think it should have just been one of blum house's movies they didn't yeah. need the purge it could have just been sinister or just been insidious and moved on. I I would have rather than or the death day. I yeah. actually would have rather it have been if they wanted to do horrors of Blumhouse did a, a upcoming for both because Happy Death Day wasn't out when the oh, event that's started. True. Yeah, yeah. They should have did Happy Death Day and Insidious Four. And I then, think that and would then have been, been a like great a house. preview, like a coming attractions yeah. house. That would have been yeah. Good. I, I would I wish that would have been how they went, but that's why it fell so low. Uh, seven for me was Ash versus Evil Dead. Again, I love the series. It just this was probably. In terms of all the houses that kind of just got bad as the event went on because it, of it laziness or really stuff. really high, yeah. Yeah, it, this this was the least – this didn't improve at all. This, this just kind of fell apart as the event went on. And I think part of the issue, too, was it, it was hard for the actors, I'm sure, to get into it when the line was generally anywhere between five minutes or 15 minutes. And then Since on the that final last two terrible nights, terrible night that it was an hour, like <laughs> yeah. seventy five minutes or something. Yeah, so I'm sure they never really got motivated because the line never got big. It's hard to when you have gaps. It's hard to really get into it night after night after night. So uh, number six for me, which I'm even switching my list at this last moment here, uh, was American Horror Story. Yeah, I know it's, why you, you didn't like that one. I, I mean, Roanoke was the major issue. Mm -hmm. If this would have just been an asylum house or a coven house on its own in a smaller section, feel like it would have been tight, would have been yeah. awesome. Roanoke just brought this down, and it, it just... I definitely agree with that sentiment. They're trying, to, they're trying to do too much with it. Instead, why don't you break it down and focus on the things that you can do the best out of it? So that's why that, that ended up so low on my list. Uh, my number five ended up being Hive. Which Ugh, was yuck, probably yuck. my least favorite on the first night that we went in the first couple weekends. That ended up becoming the most improved. The actors, while the house, while I never got into the aesthetic, I think the cast in there realized that, okay, we have to step yeah. it up. We don't have great, great costumes. We don't have a great house in general. So let's do what we can to make it as scary as possible. And I think they actually really accomplished that. And that's why it ended up moving so far up my list. Uh, number four, Dead Waters. Again, I think this is one of the most improved because I wasn't a huge fan the first night. But between the aesthetics of the house, how beautiful it was with the scare actors really starting to find their game going through, ended up being pretty good. Uh, number three for me was The Shining. Mm. And... While I, the the problem with The Shining was it was a beautiful recreation of the movie. It was never really a scary house though. The, it was kind of scary the first couple times before you really got comfortable with it. But it there really wasn't a lot of scares in there when you start to think about it. And at the end of the day, you're not just going in for the beauty. You're also going in for the scares. So that's why. That's why I have it at three. Uh, number two, The Fallen, which I know a lot of people did not. Oh my gosh, not. we have The Fallen in the same place. Yeah. I, I know a lot of people didn't like The Fallen. I, I don't know why. I thought 
I thought the house was beautiful. No, and- the imagery is great. Too. It was like you were in hell. My friend was too afraid to go into it because he was like, I'm too religious. I get scared of yeah. demons and things like that. And I was like, oh, okay, I can respect your your yeah. feelings. Like, But I, I started thinking about that more and more that I was like, oh, okay, so the, the iconography isn't necessarily scary to you and I, but somebody who yep. is like, I fear exorcisms and demons. And de- I was like, hmm. Well, and that's usually Kylie too, but she loved this house. Yeah. So that's where, where it didn't make sense to me. But I, I thought the imagery in the house was great. I thought there were, there. I mean, towards the end of that maze, there were not a lot of scares. They definitely packed them kind of like towards the front and definitely in the middle. And then it ended pretty weak. But with the ending, it ended with the stunts, which, I mean, they're not obviously amazing stunts. It's uh, people like flinging out on rubber bands and flying up over you. But it was such a cool way to end the house. So... That's why I have it too. And then number one for me was Scarecrow. It's one of the best houses I've ever been in in any Halloween Horror Nights. It was dark. It felt super long the entire time through there. Uh, said it before on the show. It, it Literally, just the element of being in there. The, the actors could just sit in a window and not have to do any effort into it besides just like moving a little bit. And it would just, it was so close and confined that it was just so scary. Mm-hmm. It, it is one of, it was the best house this year. Could have been between this year and last year. It could be the best house of both of those years. And, you know, it, there there's not a lot in my, in the years I've been going to HHN that would beat Scarecrow. Uh, so just, just absolutely fantastic. Overall event. Not amazing this year by the end of it. No. Uh, I think if you went in the first, Probably, if you went around like the third week this year, I think that was like when everything was cooking. Yeah. When all the houses were at their best, everything. But uh, I, I will say, just to like kind of go off your sentiments about the final weekend, the the last Friday and Saturday night on the 3rd and 4th were easily the two busiest nights of the event that I saw the entire point in time. So looking back on this, I will recommend... To anyone out there, do not go on the final weekend of nope. the event. Yeah, never. It's I think it's like one of those hidden secrets that got off, uh, that got out that the the final weekend's usually not that busy, yeah. especially if it's after I Halloween. D- apologize to everybody yeah. I brought. I was like, I swear to God, last year it was dead, and so we just thought it was going to be the same yeah. thing because I thought people would be done and tired of it. Yeah, and it wasn't. So maybe uh, plan plan a trip for like the first in the first two or three weeks. Uh, that seemed to be the best this year. But, yep, that's HHN27. We're not going to talk about that anymore until next year when we get back around with HHN28. And, in fact, that's actually going to do it for this show. We're out of things to talk about. So thank you very much, Rhino, for this discussion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, thank you to everyone out there who watched and listened to this. We really do appreciate it, and uh, we appreciate you. So if you need links to anything else uh, from Diz Unplugged, go to DizUnplugged.com, as well as uh, find find our links there to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those good places. Link to our email, uopodcast at DizUnplugged.com. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, of course, remember to subscribe and leave us comments and thumbs up. And if you're listening to this on iTunes, if you still haven't subscribed to us yet, go ahead and do so. And then also rate and review us there. So thank you once again to everyone out there who listened and watched this. We really do appreciate it. And we will be back with you next week for the next episode of the Diz Unplugged Universal Edition. And I apologize there. I had to think about whether we'd be back next week uh, because I know, I know Thanksgiving is coming up, but it just one of those things I could not remember if it was this week or next week. So we will be back next week for another one, but we will not be back the week after because that will be Thanksgiving. So you will have to uh, wait a little bit while then, but I'm just going to stop talking about all of this because uh, it's getting up oh, and my intro music just started. So now I have to go. No resolutions. Bye.